people are doing. I can't see. Can I press the button? No, I don't know what this means. Not the word. But it's in Welcome to everyone. Morning, everyone. Very good, Arab Shabbos. Uh, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge our benefactor, uh, David Pine from New York, who has provided us with all of this electronic equipment. Eliyu Nishmas' father, Meshav Zalman ben Reb Chaim, and uh, we appreciate it greatly. Uh, and it should be Lahar uh, Botsa's Torah. I received a few comments about my sweater. So uh, I just want to say that uh, this was a gift to me from my youngest daughter. And when your daughter gives it to you, you wear it. <laughs> <laughs> this week's Parsha, the Parsha ends with a very strange story. Amalek <laughs> came and made war against the Jewish people at an oasis called Rafidim. Although he came, where did he come from? And why did he come? Now, we have no uh, prior indication regarding Amalek. He's mentioned in the Chumash Brashas as one of the tribes, one of the children. Uh, that uh, uh, helped populate the world. But we don't find him uh, having anything to do with uh, uh, any of the Ovos direct. And he's not an antagonist, as far as we know, to uh, Yitzchak and Yaakov. Uh, their antagonists, the Torah describes to us. Gaysa of Lovan, Shem. Yeah, we know the problems. So, where did he come from? By Yovo, he came. And uh, this is uh, an eternal problem. Because I'm a lake uh, in its uh, tribal ancestry is a certain specific group of people that populated parts of Eretz soil at one time. But in uh, Jewish history, I'm a lake has grown to become the symbol of the oppression of the Jewish people, the uh, interest to exterminate, God forbid, the Jewish people. We're a month away from Purim, so the Megillah describes Haman as being Amalek. And throughout uh, the painful story of the Jewish exile, all of those who have attempted to destroy us have been lumped under the category of Amalek. So therefore, this Parsha, like all Parshas in the Torah, is multifaceted. It's not just a story of what was, it's a story of what is, and probably what will be for the foreseeable future as well. So Amalek comes out of nowhere. 
That's why it says, he came. The Jewish people didn't threaten them. The Jewish people are leaving Egypt in triumph. The great Egyptian empire has fallen before Moshe. The Jewish people sing songs. They're eating bread that falls from heaven. They have a traveling well that supplies them with water. And they start to get mitzvot. And they have miracles. Bitter water becomes potable and drinkable. They find in the middle of the desert palm trees and fountains. So it, this is like such a sudden change that the Torah gives us no warning what's going to happen here. Uh, for instance, when the Pharaoh, when the Pharaoh uh, enslaved the Jewish people, the Torah gave us warning. The Jewish people became so numerous. They threatened the Egyptian society. So Pharaoh says, we have to somehow deal with this. So we have a warning. We have... Uh, even a rationale for what's going to happen. Amalek is without any reason whatsoever. Amalek just happens. We find that again if we refer to the Megillah. The Jewish people are living in Persia, the Persian Empire. The Jews were settled in Babylonia. The uh, king is going to have a great banquet, and he provides uh, for the Jews a lot of kosher food. Megillah, we read, Kaili, Mikaili, Shoni, you know, whatever. So you wanted Rav Rubin, he had Rav Rubin, you wanted to have Badats, he had Badats, whatever you want. He's here to accommodate the Jews. And out of nowhere comes Haman. And comes a decree to destroy the Jewish people. So the Torah indicates to us that Amalek is always an unforeseen enemy. The worst of all enemies are the unforeseen ones. The ones we know about, some we know about. And somehow we can take some sort of defensive measures. We can uh, accommodate ourselves. But the unseen enemy, the unknown enemy, is the most dangerous enemy because we are unaware of it until it arrives upon us. And that lies in this idea of Ayovo. Amalek comes, comes without warning, and he comes against all odds. Rashi says the famous uh, example of uh, the, uh, per the, uh, the fire that's burning and uh, it consumes something. So even though it consumed the uh, person that wanted to stop it by consuming in the fire became weaker. Other people saw, oh, he got burned, but we'll try it and we won't get burned. So the Torah gives us a paradigm here, something to look at, the unforeseen enemy. In our time, uh, uh, we have witnessed that uh, whatever you say, the German people were an unforeseen enemy. Who 
Who would have thought that from the Weimar Republic it would come Auschwitz? Senseless, self-destructive. And we'll read that in the Miguel again. We all know the famous truck there. Someone comes. Who was he? The Medrash says he was a barber, the Gemara says. He was not, he was a nobody. That's the nature of Hamalek. And throughout Jewish history, that has been repeated over and over and over again. It's uh, Chmelianitsky that destroys hundreds of thousands of Jews and on Tazar. Tazar is the seen enemy. We know him. Chmelianitsky is a soldier of fortune, a mercenary. Nobody heard of him. In 1648, 1649, he's responsible for the deaths of hundreds of thousands of European Jews. And that's over and over and over again in Jewish history. So that's one lesson that we have from the Parsha that Amalek comes. The nature of the Jewish people is such that even when tragedies occur, God forbid, we always search for reasons why it occurred. What happened? Because uh, we don't believe in a world that's at random. We don't believe in a world that's just kaha, that's the way it is. Something must have happened here. So Rashi itself, himself quotes the famous uh, idea of the rabbis that uh, the way station, the oasis of Rafidim stands Sherofu Yedeim Midivrei Torah. The Jewish people were weakened from their faith in the Torah. So there's a lot of problems with that uh, understanding. First of all, there was no Torah yet. This is before Muhammad Har Sinai. So they had a Dean of B'nai Noah. And uh, secondly, what does it mean, Sherofu Yadayim, that they were weakened? So some say that because there were Jews that didn't observe the Sabbath, we read about it in Parshas Morton, Jews went to collect. The idea of collecting bread on the Shabbos represents the idea of Parnassah. I got to keep my store open on Saturday. It's the busiest day of the year of the week. I have to have it open. So I will do all sorts of machinations to try and be a legal Sabbath observer while attempting to benefit from the desecration of the Sabbath. <laughs> When I was a rabbi in Miami Beach, which is a long time ago, I think it was Florida was, yeah, it was then the state in the union. The, uh, so I had uh, 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 someone in shul, a wonderful person, who was a, uh, the chief uh, salesperson in the fanciest uh, men's store than in Miami Beach. 
and he was a very successful salesman. But uh, 65% of the sales were on Saturday. And that was his way of making a living. And he had uh, two sons that were friends with my son. So on Shabbat, the boys, uh, nine years old, 10 years old, they came to shul. The father naturally could not come to shul. He was gathering the, the mun outside of the camp. So uh, after a period of time, I took it upon myself to talk to the father. I said, you know, your boys are growing up. You go, they go to the Hebrew Academy. Oh, they're, they're friends. Are all Shomer Shabbos? I said, uh, you know, maybe you can find a different line of work that would allow you to come with them every Shabbos morning to shul. They need a father. And, uh, you know, you'd be in shape. So he said to me, uh, Rabbi, I make, uh, he said, an amount, X amount in salary. He said, no one can live on that amount. So the only way that we survive financially is the commission that I have on the sale of the suits. And two-thirds of the customers are on Saturday. So I have to go to work and I have to write up the order because uh, otherwise I can't put uh, right on the table. But he said, I'll tell you what. You know, uh, people always make deals with, with rabbis and with God. <laughs> he said, uh, if you'll promise me that I will be able to make a living, I'll quit and I'll try and find another job that I can come to Shabbos to the synagogue. So I told him, you know, the key to uh, Parnassah is not in my hands. I can only promise you that if you come to the synagogue with your sons, they'll be better off and you'll be better off. But I can't promise you anything. I cannot say that you will uh, somehow be successful in another line of endeavor. But you should do the right thing anyway. Okay. Two weeks later, I see he's in shul shops with his boys. I think maybe, you know, maybe they gave him a day off. The next week he's in shul. The third week is the show. So I went over to him afterwards and I said, you know, I, I admire you and I think that you did a great thing that uh, now you're able to be with your boys in shul and Shabbos, et cetera. So he said to me, listen, Rabbi, I went to another rabbi in town and he promised me. <laughs> the man never made a living again in his life. The shul we used to send money. His children grew up. I don't know about both of them. One of them, I certainly know, was a uh, Fully observant Jew, fine. But uh, you can't promise things that are not in your ability to deliver. And you don't know how things work out. 
But one of the ideas of why Amole came is because people put their bread, or what they thought was the bread, and the bread turned to worms. Eventually, the bread always turns to worms. That's why the Gemara says that when one leaves the world, he should leave no inheritance. Spend it all, which I'm trying to do. <laughs> So that's another lesson here. So Amalek is completely unexpected. And when the Medrash looks for a reason, then Rashi quotes it, Sharufu Yudeya Medivrei Torah is because of the fact they put other things ahead of it. Even before they had a Torah, they had Shabbos already. And they knew that Shabbos had sustained them in Egypt for centuries. It was the concession that Moshe obtained. Can't work seven days a week, except in our society, 24 7. So that's the second lesson that we learned from this case here of Amalek. Third lesson. Moshe says to Yahushua. Now, who's Yahushua? We never heard of him. The Torah didn't give us any introduction. Later on, we'll have descriptions of Yoshua. Narlo Yomish Mitocha Oel. He's a tremendous uh, diligent student of Moshe. He's Moshe's successor. He's one of the great uh, believers in Jewish society. He will stand up against uh, the spies. He will eventually lead the Jewish people in their soil. But here we don't know him. He's Josh. Who is he? And Moshe says, Vahemer Moshe le Yoshua, Vachar Lonu Anoshim. Find for us people. Let's say he lochev Amalek and go out and fight Amalek. Yeshua is a complicated personality. He's the great general of the Jewish people, and he's the Rosh Yeshiva. He sits and learns all day. You want to uh, fight Amalek? You know, take a four-star general and give him... Uh, Weapons to go out and fight. And what does it mean, Anoshim, choose people? So, one of the most difficult uh, assignments to leadership is the ability to choose people. Every successful uh, commercial enterprise is because somehow the right people are running it. The only exception is government, but otherwise, we always try to get the right people. If you have the right people, the business will go. It's the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, uh, a uh, computer company that went out of business long ago, and Apple. Apple has a chief executive, uh, Tim Cook, that everybody says is the, the greatest genius in the world. 
and he surrounds himself with the best people he can find, and so therefore the, the company goes. So the task of leadership is Bahar Lodu Anoshi. Find the right people. And Yoshua apparently has that innate talent that Moshe saw it within him. And therefore, even though Yeshua comes from the tribe of Ephraim, and he's not from the tribe of Yehuda, which is royalty and government, and he's not from the tribe of Levi, which is piety and Torah, and he's not from the tribe of Yisachar, that uh, is the yeshiva world, Moshe says, you have this ability. Find for me the right people. Because the only way to defeat Amalek is with the right people. The only way to survive Amalek. We see a fourth lesson. It says at the end, Yeshua only was able to weaken Amalek is never defeated. Even when it loses, it comes back again. There's no finality with Amalek. There are other enemies. When it's over, it's over. Not the Amalek. Amalek, he only weakened them. And that's why it says, It's an eternal struggle. There'll always be Amalek. You'll always have to fight him. The only way to fight him is to make sure that you don't collect your bread against the will of the Torah. And the only way to fight him is to find the right people, to invest in the right people. The Punavirov told me long ago. I asked him once, uh, you know, uh, then he was what I considered to be an old man. My definition changes from year to year. But he was already in his 70s. And he's flying all over uh, the world. So I said to him, uh, you know, Rebbe, well, huh? maybe a little less. And he said to me, you don't understand. He said, everybody that gives me money for the yeshiva, they're investing in me. They're not investing in the yeshiva. They don't know anything about the yeshiva. They don't know which side Tasris is in Rashi. They're investing in me. People, he said, invest in me, so I have to uh, repay their investment. I can't tell them I'm tired. I can't tell them I'm not going to do it. So that was the concept that Yoshua had. We invest in people. You have the right people, then everything works. So there are so many basic lessons we learn from this little Parsha, which remains enigmatic and mysterious still till the end. When it says, shalem, Hashem shalem, so to speak, heaven is not fulfilled. Even God, so to speak, his name is not fulfilled. Milchoma la Hashem ba'amolek midor dor. So the war against Amalek is not the war of the Jewish people alone. It's the war of godliness. It's the war of morality. It's the war of justice. It's the war of right against wrong. And that's an eternal struggle. That's one that's never won completely. 
But one has to hope that one is on the right side of the struggle. And therefore, just as Moshe raised his hands and the Jewish people were triumphant, so too in our time, when we raise our hands as well in prayer, Amalek will be defeated and we will be triumphant. Shabbat Shalom, everyone, and thank you for coming. Stay dry and stay warm. Last thing is to get the